So welcome everyone. Welcome everyone out there in Facebook land. Welcome everyone here in our Zoom connection. And those of us here in the sanctuary, we have our bell ringers that are here and uh, welcome all to this time. Our Truthful Tuesdays began as uh, vigils to overcome white supremacy and Christian dominionism. And we have also through this pandemic been speaking truthfully about vaccines and medical needs and community responsibilities. But tonight we're doing something different. We are, we talked in our planning that with everything that's been going on with the cold and the long nights and how so many of our faith and non-faith traditions speak about light, that we needed some warm light in cold times. So our vigil tonight is one that looks at four traditions. However, we know there are many, many more of you there on Zoom as well as on Facebook. For those who are on Zoom, if you write any of your favorite passages, your favorite sacred texts, whatever you write, there'll be a time in the vigil where I will read those for the whole group. So feel welcome to write those in. For those on Facebook, feel free to put those also into the comments. While I may not get to see all of those during our vigil, I know that those who are with you on Facebook will appreciate your sacred texts and your words of encouragement. And now we turn to this time of vigil. If you haven't already, if you want to bring a candle to your vigil, to our vigil, um, you might wanna get that now and you can light it any time that it feels like the right time to add a light. Pam, hold on just a second while I take the pin off of my name and put it on yours. Go ahead, Pam. As we gather this evening, we recognize and honor that we are gathering on the occupied ancestral homelands of the Spokane tribe, the Coeur d'Alene, the Nimi'ipui people, and many others. We gather in the places we live today and recognize that wherever we are, we are on sacred ground. A vigil is a time of being alert to what is happening around us while others sleep. Tonight's vigil happens at a time in our world where great pain is not only being experienced through the coronavirus pandemic, but also through the exposure of the undeniable systemic racism in our country. Our goal as faith leaders and leaders of conscience is to speak in one moral voice in order to overcome racism, poverty, militarization, and ecologic devastation. We confront our history without shaming or blaming, seeking to speak truth with a goal of a better future. Tonight, we pause. We quiet ourselves. It is December. We become aware of what our many faith and non-faith practices offer for the long, cold winter nights. We listen for teachings and guidance from our four speakers and from each other. We will hear from people from Buddhist, Christian, earth-based spirituality, and Jewish traditions. This will be followed by a time of reading any encouraging words or sacred text you place in the chat. Let us start with this beautiful passage in the children's book, Sulwe, by Lupita Nyong'o. Night returned and the people rejoiced. We need the darkest night to get the deepest rest. We need you so that we can grow and dream and keep our secrets to ourselves. The stars chimed in. Brightness isn't just for daylight. Light comes in all colors. And some light can only be seen in the dark. While day had a golden glow, with night everything had a silver sheen, elegant and fine. Day told her sister, when you are darkest is when you are most beautiful. It's when you are most you. 
Could it be that night did not need to change? Not even a little, not even at all. Thank you, Pam. And now we hear from our speakers. Let me just set this. Venerable Jampa, would you introduce yourself and let people know what it is you'd like us to know about you and Shravasti and give to us your words. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being able to be here with you. And I'm from Shravasti Abbey in Newport, Washington. And we are a community right now of um, 20 people, um, about 17 monastics, and the other ones are trainees. And we are mostly nuns. We have one monk and two male friends who are helping us here and training with us together. And our daily life is totally dedicated to the Buddha's teaching from morning till evening. And we have dedicated our whole life um, to this path as monastics, to meditate, um, to study, to practice, and to serve um, the communities surrounding us and worldwide. And tonight I would like to share with you uh, one of my favorite practices, how to overcome challenges. For me, light is um, similar to love. And uh, if I have love in my heart, I am shining. If I see love in others' heart, they are shining. So right now we have um, a lot of fear, loneliness, grief um, in our surroundings. We may not like to be separated from our family, from our friends, loved ones, especially now when we have Christmas coming up. We may be unhappy being unable to travel freely, um, to see each other faces, to see our children or even uh, seeing them going to school or to be laid off at work. There's so much going on right now. So I like to turn our attention to the peaceful part in ourselves. We are not broken. We are still the loving, compassionate, powerful being we have ever been. Our mind has immense capacities to deal with the challenges we are facing right now. We get into problems. Um, so if we close to our heart during that process. I have a beautiful quote on my altar that's in German. I'm originally from German, living here since nine years. That's by the Dalai Lama and translates in English as Open your arms to change, but never lose your love in your heart. So how do we do that? How do we overcome changes, even unwelcome ones with open arms? How to remain joyful and loving? So first we start um, by finding this joy in ourselves, within ourselves, independently upon the circumstances we are finding ourselves in. And joy comes from a positive mindset, a mind that's based on cherishing others. And this can be trained. That's what we are doing as Buddhists. We are meditating and training our mind and cherishing others. It's one of the most important practices we are focusing on. We train our mind to look at ourselves with kind eyes. So we start with ourselves always. And then we look at others with kind eyes as well. So when I cherish myself, I'm kind to myself. When I cherish others, I'm kind to others. And then second, I can look at what is the benefit of this situation I'm facing right now. And, and the activity may bring to me and others I'm doing. So I can, for example, prevent the spread of COVID by staying at home or keeping distance or wearing a mask. Now there are many families separated and especially our older generations who are living in old folks' homes. They have very limited access um, to their loved ones. And it's, yeah, just yesterday I was visiting an old folks' home and they have very limited um, opening hours. So, but we don't need to feel helpless. I felt for a moment helpless, but then we had a thought. And why not writing Christmas cards? to those who are in the old folks homes who don't have a lot of contact right now. So our community will on the next days write Christmas cards and give them to the old folks home nearby and they will add the names of the residents. So there's something we can do always, little things like that and bring a lot of joy, not just to ourselves but to others as well. So we can create loving connections to ourselves and to others in these challenging times. And then third, 
And sometimes the situation may be so tense, so immense that writing postcards or seeing the benefit of um, unwelcome change, difficult situations, and they're so strong um, that um, one may feel overwhelmed, but there's still possibilities to overcome these. I personally have two um, ways um, that I'm applying when there's a very challenging situation in front of me or I'm right in the middle of it. One way is to check it all out. It's not spiritual at all, <laughs> but you may have seen it with your dog or cat or you have seen it uh, in the animal realm watching birds or um, deers when they are attacked. Uh, after the attack, when they survive the attack, they shake themselves, the whole body, you know, from feet to head. So I do that sometimes, just 30 seconds. I just shake my whole body and then I just calm down and then I feel something changed, shifted in myself. The other way is um, to use poetry or writing, painting or play. So this is also not very spiritual, but um, I find it spiritual in the way that it helps me to come back to my heart. And if my heart is open, I find um, spirituality within myself. So for example, in my case, I love to play, not playing with a ball or something like that or doing competition um, play. I love making others smile. Um, so I can just smile at somebody else or tap them on the shoulder or, you know, maybe I have a little toy on my table and I just playfully throw it towards them with warning, like a very soft ball or something like that. Um, and then after I find this connection with the other person and my own smile back, then I have this um, center within myself, I can touch my heart and I can come back to the meditation we are doing every day here. And I can recognize and transform the workings of my mind that is so essential for these days. And so I encourage everybody to do whatever it takes to come back to your heart whatever it is that touches you, to nourish it, not to be um, distracted by all the um, challenges or by our busyness. And again, yes, we live in very difficult times and or face some discomfort with the changes we are having right now. And we have choices how to respond. We can benefit so many people, including ourselves during this time. And let's be there for ourselves and for others. Let's be fully present in the here and now. And we can tell our loved ones, dear one, I'm here for you. And we can start with ourselves, dear one, I'm here for you. Dear one, I'm here for you. That's all I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanopal. I ask for us just to take a few maybe not even a whole minute, but just to have a moment in silence and maybe with your candle, if you've already lit that, or maybe just to be um, aware of your heart, aware of the love that shines from you to others. And I'll watch the clock and just give us a few seconds of silence. And now I will change the pin on here and here. And I ask Reverend Mike Denton to speak to us. And uh, Reverend Denton, would you begin with a short introduction of who you are? Sure. Uh, well, good to be with all of you here on this on this evening, uh, and all the different ways and all the different places where we're, we're having our evenings. Um, it's it's a, an interesting time to gather around the variety of tables that we all might be sitting at and be able to be present with each other in that way, and it's a good thing. Um, I, uh, I, I, my title is conference minister, and that means that I work with United Church of Christ churches that are in Washington State, uh, North Idaho, and Alaska. Um, so there's about 78 churches. 
uh, within that, that arena or that area. We also have two camps. Uh, we've got one out on Lake Coeur d'Alene um, that's called Incidson. And then we also have one over on the peninsula called Pilgrim Furs. And they're both working to serve people during this time of pandemic as well within their various settings. Um, and I also have a hair in my mouth, <laughs> um, which, you know, happens. Um, the, uh, uh, which in some ways is just about perfect because uh, I started working on something uh, for this moment for this time about three different times. And, and every time I, I got partway through, I'd be like, yeah, this isn't really what I want to say. And my mind would wander and it would go off to a, uh, another place. And so uh, I, I ask your, your patience today as I, I do something that is, is messier as opposed to perfect. Um, Cause I think this is sort of this time that's a messy time. Um, when you look at the, the uh, sort of summer always seems sort of perfect. You know, it's sort of, you know, pretty trees and all these beautiful colors and all that stuff. And then we get to this time period and we get to this place in this time and it's messy. Um, it's, it's beautiful. The snow can be beautiful. The skies on a cold day are particularly beautiful. The changing colors can be beautiful. And it's a little more muddy. And there's more uh, things that we have to leave at the door. And, you know, there's all, all the different ways in which this time period is messy. And when you think about all of this time, it's messy. Uh, part of the reason that I was recognizing I was getting caught when I was doing the, uh, the writing is I kept on going back to sort of a, an experience of a day. Um, a fairly recent one, and it was the day after uh, Thanksgiving, and I had nothing to do um, except be at home. I had uh, no other Zoom call to be on. I didn't have to reach out to anybody else. Um, on that day, I didn't have anything to do, and and I felt lousy. I just felt lousy. Um, there was uh, uh, the, it was sort of this time where a lot of what the last several months have been um, kind of settled in in an entirely different sort of way. And uh, I tried to, in that moment, um, to turn to scripture. And sometimes I turn to watch stupid videos, but this time I turned to scripture, um, to be honest with you. And, uh, and, and the, the one that I found was uh, sort of from the Beatitudes. Um, you know, Jesus's words uh, to those who were gathered around as he taught and he said, uh, those who mourn will be comforted. And I, I began to deal with the reality that I haven't fully mourned. Um, in some ways, I put off a lot of the mourning because there's too many things to do. There's not enough time uh, for the mourning. I put off some of that mourning. And, and I began to uh, sort of grapple with that and, uh, and wanting the comfort um, the comfort that was promised within that lesson, that those who mourn shall be comforted. Um, I wanted that comfort, but I, re I really didn't want to mourn. So I started to have uh, this image today, and, I, and it's one I want to share with you, and it's related to this image of light. And so I, I sort of imagined uh, mourning, the, the process of mourning, as, as a log we put on the fire. And it's from that log that we put on the fire um, that the comfort comes. Blessed are those who mourn, for you be comforted. Um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of times where we, we want peace, but we don't always want to uh, uh, deal with and feel some of the, the anger that might be on the other side of that, that peacefulness. Um, we want hope, but we don't always want to feel that, 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 that hopelessness. Um, but the, the most spiritual thing that humans can really do is be human. And by recognizing those things, when we, when we go ahead and we use those things that are the fuel inside of us that, that help us find that way to comfort, that help us find that way to peace, that help us find that way to hope, when we go ahead and, and let those, those other things that come along with it and that accompany them uh, be that fuel that brings those things to us, that would free, that's what frees up space in us to make room for comfort, to make room for hope, to make room for peace. So uh, the, uh, this isn't something that is you know, particularly deep as far as any Christian scriptures go in any one form or one way. Um, but again, I think our most important uh, task as humans is to be, have the opportunity to be deeply spiritual and to be deeply human and recognize that being deeply human is being deep, deeply spiritual. And so on this night, on this day, as we talk about the, the messiness that might be the weather, the messiness that might be our lives, the messiness that might be the world, um, may we also be able to take that morning 
and put it on the fire and find that comfort. May we also be able to find that, that, that anger and through feeling it, recognize peace. May we also uh, deal with the reality of our hopelessness and by doing so, find hope. So that's my wish and my blessing for all of us on this day. Thank you, Mike. And again, I invite us to take just a few seconds to be with those words, to let whatever is whatever strikes you to allow that to bubble up and be with you. Bill Hall, I invite you to introduce yourself and speak to us. Happily. So my name is Bill Hall and the spiritual tradition that I grew up in was Judaism and from Judaism I got my commitment to social justice and um, um, a sense that part of my mission was, or part of who I am is to heal, is healing the, the wounds, healing the divides between us. And the place where I connected most spiritually was with a, a woman who was my part, friend and then partner for 30 years named Margot Adair. So I do a lot of the work that I do in her name. She developed a form of meditation called applied meditation, working with our imagination, intuition, and the witness or mindfulness. We've learned a lot from our Buddhist friends and in many, many ways. And um, the more that I've gotten in touch with my spiritual side, the more I recognize that it was connected to the, to the place that I live in, to the places that I love, to, the, um, to a sense of the living earth as a whole. So that's how I define myself in terms of earth spirituality. I've, I've studied with many teachers, um, but I come to spirit through um, finding that place inside that all of our the first two speakers were speaking to. So um, at this moment in time, uh, I'm reminded of two people who are, um, one of whom has passed on and one of whom is still alive. And they both are named Charlie, Charlie Murphy, uh, who is an amazing songwriter and gay liberation um, member of the gay liberation movement. Um, and Charlie Barron, who is a, a, a Jewish comic in the Bay Area. And the time that I'm thinking of was in the 1980s. I'm gonna repeat a few lyrics from Charlie's song, um, Light is Returning in a minute. Um, and um, I want to recover, recount a story about Charlie Barron. So in the 1980s, I think all of us were around at that time. We remember the Reagan years. We remember the nuclear freeze and uh, all the struggles in Central America and all the things. And it felt like the world was ending or potentially ending. And we can go back in history and know all the different times when our uh, human beings are feel like it's the end of the world. And maybe it is possible this time. Um, so Charlie was really depressed in the 19, early 1980s with Reagan, with the wars, with nuclear um, challenges. He couldn't even get out of bed. He watched um, evangelical preachers on the TV because that was all he could do. And he actually wrote a, um, a piece which was basically a, a little evangelical tract on evolution and hope. And uh, I don't have that with me, but I always remember that he, he gave a preaching as a Jewish man about uh, getting rid of the lesslessnesses, um, hopelessness, fearfulness, and I can't remember the other one, 
but how we have to give that up. And the way that he got out of bed in the morning, he would always bring this out during his acts. He would have a, a worry meter because he couldn't figure out which thing to worry about that day. And he would just spin the dial and that was what he would worry about that day. So he wouldn't get overwhelmed with that. So that's, I think about Charlie in this moment as I feel oh, there's so many challenges that are coming our way. Um, and Charlie Murphy wrote a song at this time. He, he sang it with, uh, and he was a pagan. Um, he, but he sang with Pat Wright in the Total Experience Choir in Seattle back in the day. And although he had recorded albums and so on, he used to say that uh, when he sang with Pat, he finally learned about how to use his voice. It's an amazing youth choir. I don't know if it's still going. Maybe Reverend Mike would know that. It is. Uh, bringing up the youth in the community in uh, powerful ways. So he sang this song, he wrote it earlier, but it was around 1984 and it was right around this time. The album was called Canticles of Light and the lyric is, light is returning even though this is the darkest hour. No one can hold back the dawn. Let's keep it burning. Let's hold, uh, keep the light alive. A light of hope alive. Make uh, make safe our journey through the storm. And I always think about that in this moment, um, about how Charlie, who died of ALS maybe five years ago, um, kept holding up the light of creativity and spirit and all of his music and all of his connections. So um, just keep remembering in this moment as we go into the darkness of the, towards the solstice that light's returning. Um, I'd like to lead us through a little bit of a meditation or um, you can follow my words or just take the time to reflect in your own way, but just to, um, to connect us uh, for just a few minutes with the place that we're in, the time that we're in, and the heart space that we're in. Uh, so if you'd like, you can close your eyes or just have a gentle focus down towards the table or the floor and take a few breaths. And as you're breathing, and just notice how your body is feeling. And if you'd like, you can imagine your breath bringing ease to any part that's tight or not in balance. And you can notice in your mind's eye, all the thoughts that are coming and going as rapidly as one comes up, another one comes by. And just watch those thoughts and know that those thoughts are there as your friends, but they're not you. With a relaxed body and mind, you can turn to your feelings to your heart or to your gut, wherever your feelings reside for you. And just notice them too. And notice where there's worry, there's hope. Where there's anger, there's love. Where there's fear, there's courage. And now just for a moment, you could imagine opening to the place you're in. You notice the sounds and the smells and the feeling of the air on your skin. And then maybe take an imaginative leap and feel into the surroundings outside the walls where you are. Notice the night winter, things are asleep or seeming to be. All the beings, visible and invisible, our animal friends, our plant friends, all the beings, human beings, 
that may not have shelter. Notice how it feels to be connected to the place. And notice that even as it's dark and cold, freezing maybe where you are, maybe not so freezing, there's a myriad of life that's happening there's things that are happening in the apparent stillness. Life is vibrant at the same time as it's resting. And if you like, you can extend your attention further out, further out and further out as far as you can imagine feeling the complexity of all that's happening that we're a part of. You might offer gratitude or compassion if there's anything that's calling your attention. Now drawing your attention a little bit closer, you can imagine the life energy that's there, even in the dark, even in the cold. And bring it closer and closer to home. And again, if you wish, you can draw that life energy back to you to take as you need. Have courage where there's fear. Love where there's anger. And compassion for yourself and all that is. And even though this is the darkest hour, light is returning and actually is inside us. And opening your eyes, remembering the connection to all beings and to yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Again, give us a few seconds just to be with that. And thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Tamar Molino, for being uh, also one of the speakers tonight. Would you introduce yourself? Let us know about your community and give to us the words you brought. Thank you very much, Jen. And thank you, Bill, for that beautiful meditation and Reverend Mike and um, Venerable. I am. Um, going to return us a little bit to headspace and then we'll go back to heart space. So uh, I am the rabbi of Temple Beth Shalom and Congregation Emmanuel. And of course, this time of year, we celebrate Hanukkah, otherwise known as Chag Horim, this festival of lights. And so I wanted to talk just a second about the meaning and the message of Hanukkah first. Um, Hanukkah is a historical based holiday. Many Jewish holidays are based in historical events. Um, and Hanukkah tells the story of 
uh, an event that took place in the year 168 to 166 BCE. The Assyrian king Antiochus Epiphanes took his soldiers into Jerusalem and conquered the area and the city and desecrated the ancient temple in Jerusalem and essentially outlawed practice, traditional practice of Judaism during that time. And um, there was a, a rebellion against his rule and his oppression um, led by the Mac otherwise known as the Maccabees, the Hasmonean uh, family. Um, that was Judah Maccabee was the major military leader of the Jewish people at that point. Um, and his father, Matityahu, was the strategist. And they fought back against the Assyrian oppression and were able to reclaim the land and reclaim the temple and be able to return to worshiping there. And the story really has several levels in the way that we tell it now. Um, and on one hand, it's this story of a military victory. And that's a story of um, religious freedom of the success of and the um, privilege of religious freedom. It's a story of perseverance in the face of oppression. It's the story of tremendous hope that the that the minority, that the the few, will be able to defeat the many. Many, because of course the um, Jewish fighting force was far smaller than the Assyrian Empire that it was fighting against. So that's one version of the story. Uh, another version of the story about Hanukkah, and the word Hanukkah itself, by the way, means rededication. So it re refers to rededicating the temple after the Maccabees won the battle, um, being able to rededicate the temple to, um, to traditional uh, worship of that time. And so that's one story that is told, which is the story from the, the original sources, uh, which is about a military victory and about re rededicating the temple to be able to offer the, the sacrifices of the holiday of Sukkot. Another story that's told as the generations continued was a story of what happened when they went to try to rededicate the temple, which was that they only found one little cruise of oil that and they needed the celebration to last eight days because they were celebrating the holiday of Sukkot that's that long and they only had this one little cruise of oil purified oil that would be put in the menorah in the temple and miraculously that oil lasted for eight days and rather than the miracle of the military victory of the few against the many it became a celebration of the miracle of the oil lasting for eight days and it's funny because that story, you know, is a story we tell to children thinking it's no big deal. And I saw something on the internet not that long ago that talked about that miracle of the oil lasting for eight days and, you know, which, I don't know, it doesn't land all that much as a miracle. And then they said, imagine your cell phone at 12%, but having the last eight days. And I thought that, that's a way that we can in contemporary life maybe conceive of that experience a little bit. Um, but the way the story is told about the miracle of the oil was a very deliberate move on the part of the rabbis of our tradition to change it from a story emphasizing military victory and military might to a story about light and about spirit. Um, and in particular, they brought to bear um, one of the prophetic readings for this time of year and for the holiday of Hanukkah is from the prophet Zechariah, lo b'chaya lo b'koach ki im beruchi, not by might, not by power, but my, my spirit, says God. Right? God says that the perseverance and the miracle, the miracle of this time of year is the light of the human spirit. So the holiday of Hanukkah really does celebrate not just, um, not just the military victory, but the miracle of each of our spirits. And it's interesting, and, and of course the miracle that the oil lasted for eight days. Part of the tradition of Hanukkah also is to light your Hanukkah menorah in your window so that you show the light to the world and you publicize this amazing miracle of perseverance and of the human spirit. And one of the other aspects of the holiday, one of the other traditional debates of this holiday is a debate that took place during the rabbinic period about how you lit the Hanukkah candles. Would you light them one each night? Would you light them one the first night and two the second night and three the third night? Would you light right and on going up until eight nights? Or would you light them in the reverse? Would you start with eight and then light seven and six? Because 
if the miracle is the is the the cruise of oil lasting for eight days, right? There would have been less of it each day. Um, and of course, the tradition comes down. Hillel, for those of you who who know that uh, know that teaching, right? Hillel comes down and says, no, we don't. Uh, we don't decrease in light. We always increase in light because we increase in matters of holiness. Um, and we see the, the increase of light and the increase of the power of the human spirit and of the holiness. And there's another tradition, a verse from Psalms that says that the soul of the human being is like the candle of God. And when we light our candles, we are bringing the divine spirit of each individual person into the world. And another wonderful aspect of candles, of course, is that if you use one to light the next, it doesn't diminish that first candle. It only increases the light all around. So what I'd like to do actually is light. It's not Hanukkah yet. Hanukkah is in, in uh, a couple of days. Um, but I don't know if you can see. Maybe you can see a little bit. Here's the menorah you can see. Um, and not, um, so, but in a Hanukkah menorah, there's one candle in the center and that candle is called the shamash. It's the helper candle that you use to actually light the other eight candles. And so what I'd like to do is just take a moment to light this candle and maybe it can be a little bit of a, a visual meditation for us because it's the light of the candles that represents the human spirit and the strength of the human spirit. It's the light of perseverance in a dark time and the strength in each of us. And also it's the central candle that we use to light other candles. It's the candle that gives us the chance to give light to others as well. May we all be blessed to bring light to one another during this dark time. Thank you, Rabbi. Again, give us a few seconds just to be with that helper candle. I was just looking on our Facebook feed and I don't see any comments or special um, sacred texts there to share at this time. I know Lonnie, you were bringing some, I don't see it in the chat. But would you like to unmute and bring the words that you thought you wanted to share with folk tonight? I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I just, it was just a uh, uh, statement. Um, I have not no religious tradition. And uh, I just take what I get and I've so enjoyed this. And so it was just some words from Dr. Who about this time of the year. And what we need to look at is we're halfway into the light. The dark is over and we're at the 21st. We're halfway into the light and that's the way to look at it. And that was it. Well, thank you, Lonnie. Did someone else have words? You, I don't see them in the chat, but we're small enough if somebody wanted to unmute to read your words. Well, I thank our speakers. I thank all of you for being here tonight. I thank you for this chance to be together. It is the custom at our vigils that we ring the bell. We ring this bell to ring out, ring out a call to our inner light to shine brighter. Uh, we ring out our grief. We ring out our hope. 
We ring out truth and we ring out love. Let us hear the ringing of the bells. Jane, you want to come right up to the microphone? Petra writes in the comments, the song, This Little Light of Mine. And Carrie Brown, there is a crack in everything. That's how light gets in. By Leonard Cohen. And Wendy, I'm going to in your place here so that you can read to us our closing words. Currently, the faith leaders and leaders of conscience are planning to not have a vigil in January. So our next vigil will be on the second Tuesday. Our Truthful Tuesday vigils are always on the two Tuesday to try to help us be a memorable, a memory tool. <laughs> So, um, Truthful Tuesday, the second Tuesday of the second month, uh, will be our next Truthful Tuesday. Again, thank you all. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to all who have come tonight to be part of this. I hope that you have gotten some sense of a balm, a, a salve in these difficult times. And now, Wendy. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, be a voice for the voiceless. Our time of vigil has ended, our time of vigilance continues. Amen. Thank you. And now, go back. What I will do now is um, invite all of you who are here. I will close us off on Facebook. And then, like we would do if we were able to meet in person, I invite those who are here to open your microphones, to say your goodbyes to everyone. And um, 